We continue our series, Sunday morning series, in uh, Romans, and uh, as you know, we've arrived at chapter 9. We call last Sunday morning sermon, uh, Why Doesn't God Save Everyone and Other Questions? And we saw that if you're saved, it's not down to you, it's down to God. The God who chose to save you before the world was made, and not because of anything he foresaw in you but because of his sovereign good pleasure. It's what's called the doctrine or the teaching of election. And we finish the message by asking four questions. Question number one, why do people go to hell? Because God doesn't choose them. They go to hell because they're sinners, because that's just, that's fair. God is not obliged to show anyone mercy. If mercy was deserved, it wouldn't be mercy. And so if mercy is withheld, no one is wronged. Why then do people go to heaven? Because God chose to have mercy upon them. He didn't give them what they deserve. And the punishment they deserve has fallen upon Jesus Christ. Well, why doesn't God choose to save everyone? Well, what is our sin? What is the sin of the human race? Paul puts it like this, Romans 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. In our unrighteousness, we suppress the truth about God. Now, is God unrighteous? No, God is righteous. So if to be unrighteous is to suppress the truth about God, then to be righteous is to reveal the truth about God. So God says, chapter 9, uh, verse 17, For Scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. God always acts for his glory. In his righteousness, he reveals the truth about himself. And therefore, he reveals that he's the God of wrath. Because justice demands that rebels, that sinners, be punished. But he also reveals he's the God of grace. Because love demands that sinners be rescued. And if judgment is his strange work, says the Bible then grace is his default position. So he saves a great number, a number so great, says the book of Revelation, that it can't be numbered. So that against the backdrop of his wrath, chapter 9, verse 22, we might see the riches of his saving love. Verse 23, For what if God designed to show his wrath and to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called. Unrighteousness, you hide the truth. You suppress the truth about God. Righteousness, you reveal the truth about God. If God is righteous, he must reveal the truth about himself, who he is, the totality of his being, the fullness of his glory. And that means he will reveal himself as both a God of justice and a God of grace. So number four. If the sovereign God has chosen our destinies... How can he still hold me responsible for the choices that I make? Well, upon this piece of paper is an ant. Okay, and the ant walks where he chooses. This ant has free will. Uh, he exercises his free will, and the ant is responsible for the direction which he takes. And yet, by turning the paper, the ant walks where I choose. So his actions are free, no one's forcing him, and yet by turning the paper, the ant fulfills my will. Okay, one ant. What about two ants? What about a hundred ants on the bit of paper? 
Well, God's sovereignty is so big that he's ordained that the choices that each of us make are our own free choices. What I do really is my free choice. And yet our free choices fulfill his sovereign will. So the Bible teaches that God is sovereign. And the Bible teaches that I am responsible for what I do. Well, maybe all this is new to you. Maybe you know it and you don't like it. Maybe you believe it and you love it. How are we to respond to all of this? What is the Christ-like response to the teaching of election? Well, come with me to the other side of the sheet, to Matthew 11. Because faced with these very questions, what did Jesus do? And we have five things to say. And the first is this, number one. <coughs> excuse me, human responsibility. Verse 20, then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable, more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you have been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it would be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. So here are three cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. They've witnessed, verse 20, the mighty works of Jesus. They've been at the heart of his Galilean ministry. Uh, his ministry in Galilee, especially Capernaum. It'd been the, Capernaum had been actually the centre of his ministry in Galilee. So what have these cities witnessed? Well, they witnessed that the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, They've even seen the dead raised, and the demons fear and fly. The mighty works of Jesus. There was not a family in those cities that hadn't been touched by Jesus' ministry, particularly Capernaum. You can read about it in the Gospels. Wonderful. And so the, the message to these cities was unmistakable. Messiah is here. The kingdom of heaven has come. The king is taking charge. The long night is over. It's the dawning of a new age, God's long-promised salvation. The mighty works of Jesus. And yet, what have they done? Absolutely nothing. They carried on as before. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. They heard his word, they saw his works, and did absolutely nothing. They remained unchanged. So whose fault was that? Was there a lack of evidence? Lack of clarity? Lack of opportunity? No, they were without excuse. These are the most privileged cities on earth. And yet they refuse to repent. They refuse to come to the Messiah. And the fault was theirs. And no one else's. And said, so Jesus, you are responsible for what you have done. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works have been done because they, they did not repent. And says, Jesus, it's a responsibility which will be clear enough on judgment day when justice is seen to be done. He says, if pagan slave trading Tyre and Sidon had witnessed what you witnessed, if proud, wicked Sodom had witnessed what you witnessed, they would have repented but you did not repent. 
Oh yes, God will give you every benefit of the doubt. But there can be no doubt that your spiritual privileges are great, greater than Tyre and Sidon, and that your light was great, greater than Sodom, and therefore your condemnation will be great, greater than Tyre's and Sidon's and Sodom. <coughs> Woe to you! I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. These cities have destroyed themselves. They are guilty. And God is just. Human responsibility. Now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Jesus says the greatest sinners are not those who buy and sell men's souls or those guilty of homosexual rape. The greatest sinners are those who hear the word of God and do nothing. Point number two, God's sovereignty. Look at verse 25. So why haven't the cities of Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum repented? Well, it's because they were wise in their own eyes. They were too enlightened. They felt too sure of themselves, too smart to be taken in by the carpenter from Nazareth. Why then do Jesus' disciples believe? Because by contrast, they are nothing in their own eyes. And if you like, they are naive enough to take Jesus at his word. But that's not the whole story. Verse 25, at that time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and have revealed them to little children. So the ultimate reason why the wise and perceptive people of these cities don't believe is because God has hidden it from them. And the ultimate reason why the childlike disciples do believe is that God has revealed it to them. So, my friend, be warned. If you consider yourself one of the enlightened, you say, I see, and that's why I don't believe this stuff, then God will close your eyes. But if you say, I can't see, but I know it's important, I really want to see, then he will open your eyes. But either way, it's God who opens or closes the eyes. So when Jesus was at work in these cities, so was the Father. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding. The Lord of heaven and earth has a plan for heaven and earth. And since there is nothing outside heaven and earth, everything is inside the Father's plan, including who is and who isn't saved. So why don't these cities believe? Because they refuse to repent. That's the truth. Woe to you. They're responsible for their unwillingness to repent. So why don't these cities believe? Because God has hidden it from them. And that's also the truth. Now, thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whom whoever he wills. Psalm 113 says this, Who is like the Lord our God, who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth? In other words, says the Bible, whenever God looks outside himself, he has to look down. Whenever God looks outside himself, he has to humble himself. He has to look down. He has to condescend. There is no one higher than God. And therefore, the reason for what God does is not to be found outside himself. 
If the reason for what God did was something outside himself, it would be a lesser reason, wouldn't it? He would have to look down. It would be a reason that's down here. The reason for what God does is found within himself. So when he does what he does, he does it for himself. He does it for his pleasure, his glory. He does it to reveal his excellent majesty. Be it in the righteous judgment of Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, or be it in the gracious salvation of his people. Either way, says Jesus, he is Lord of heaven and earth. And there is nothing outside heaven and earth. He is Lord of all. And all he does in heaven and earth, and the reason he does it, is found in himself. Because there is no one above him. And if the reason lies outside himself, that is a lesser reason than himself. It happens because God wills it. Because God has free will. Because there is no one higher. He does, says the Bible, whatever he pleases. He answers to no one. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. He really is God. He's not a tame lion. So point number three, what is Jesus' reaction to all of this? On the one hand, the cities are fully responsible for what they've done, and on the other hand, they've done what they've done because God is sovereign. What's his reaction? Is Jesus indifferent to the indifference of these cities? No. What they've done in rejecting him cuts, grieves, pains. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. It's a cry of woe. There's no shrug of the shoulders here. It cuts him. It grieves him. He's incensed by the choices that they have made. And having given so much to them, these cities are without excuse. And Jesus says, woe to you. He feels it. It grieves him. And yet at the same time, he recognizes that in their unbelief, the sovereign God is at work. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding. Okay. If God chooses to save some and not others, why doesn't he choose to save them all? Why does he hide the gospel from some and reveal it to others? Why does he let Chorazin and Bethsaida damn themselves to a lower hell than Tyre and Sidon? Why does God heap up Capernaum's privileges only to let those very privileges sink them to a lower hell? Why does God do it like that? Better surely those towns never ever saw those things, never witnessed those things. Then their judgment would be more bearable. So what's Jesus' answer? I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. You see, Jesus doesn't wrestle with the question, does he? He doesn't say, why, why, why? Why doesn't God reveal the gospel to all of these people? Why does he heap up Capernaum's privileges if those privileges are to damn them to a lower hell? He doesn't wrestle with that. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. He simply bows the knee. He submits to his Father's sovereign will. He trusts the Father who does all things well. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will, or as it says in the New King James, for so it seemed good in your sight. If it's good in your sight, that's fine with me, says Jesus. See, God's election doesn't neuter God's attributes. 
If God is good, then his choices are good. If God is wise, then his choices are wise. And if God is wise, then his will for heaven and earth is then really the best of all worlds, isn't it? There can be no wiser plan. And if God is love, then his hiding and his revealing of the gospel flow from that love. It's not at that point that his love is sealed off and that side of it flows from his justice. There's no sealing off of God. There's no part of God dealing with these things and another part deals with other things. All of God is at work. These choices, these decisions of God flow as much from his eternal overflowing love as they do from his justice. And it's not a harsh will. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. That's Jesus' estimation of what has happened. Not a harsh will, but a gracious will. So faced with this doctrine of election, what does Jesus do? He simply worships and adores. I thank you, Father, because that's what seemed good in your sight. And he bows the knee. And Christian friend Jesus says, follow me. So the Bible teaches that God is sovereign. He does the choosing. And the Bible teaches that I am responsible, that I do the choosing. And the Bible teaches both unashamedly. And the Bible never tries to reconcile them. It regards them as good friends that don't need reconciling. They're reconciled in the mind of God. And Jesus is happy to leave it there. For so it seemed good in your sight. It's called faith, isn't it? It's called trusting the one who knows. Leave it with him. Charles Spurgeon speaks of a little boy who's been forbidden, been forbidden to go into his father's study. Um, he's tried the door, but it's locked. So he looks at the keyhole, but he can't see anything. So not content to leave it there. And feeling that uh, he needs to satisfy his curiosity, the little boy gets out a ladder and he puts it against the outside wall. And because his dad's study is uh, two floors up, he climbs up the ladder to get a better look. Um, into his father's study to see what his father's doing. And this is what Spurgeon says. To his father's horror, up two stories high stood his little boy, looking upon him and crying with childish pride, Father, I can see you. What a position of danger for the child. He must be gotten down and taught not to do it again. Then says Spurgeon, shall we imitate this childish folly? I will not attempt it. I do not want to endanger my soul and perhaps even my reasoning powers by straying after the unknowable. Jesus is content to let the Father be the Father. To do what the Father knows what he's doing. That's why he says, Father, for such was your gracious will. I'm happy to leave it with you. And if I too am a child of the Father and I find the study door has been locked, then I don't get the ladder and see if I can peer in and find out what he's doing. I'm content to leave it there. Christian friend, if he's locked the door, don't go looking for the ladder. Because two floors up, you may fall off. So when I cannot climb, what am I to do? I'm to bow the knee. Look at verse 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. It says, Jesus, only the Son knows the Father, and only the Father knows the Son. In other words, only God can explain God. And if God has brought us a little into the secrets, we do know a little, don't we? We have been told some things. Then be content to leave it there. Don't chafe at the sovereignty of God. 
But bless the Son, the least he's brought you a little into the Father's mind. God really is God. If I could explain God, then he wouldn't be God, would he? Let's be honest, some of us can't even explain our, our husbands and wives, can we? I mean, husbands, have you ever thought, I, I don't understand? I'm sure wives, you look at your husband and think, I, he makes no sense to me whatsoever. Or maybe he's very simple and easy to read. I don't know. But we don't even understand the people that we live with, do we? So how we can expect to understand God, Lord of heaven and earth, who's planned it all, who's landscaped it all for his pleasure and for his glory, when I can see no further than the, than the, than the garden gate. We worship the God we cannot explain. All God's equations balance. But you need the mind of God to understand them. Only God can explain God. So we bow the knee and we trust and obey. Faced with this doctrine of election, we do exactly what Jesus did. So number four. If God is sovereign and he only saves the elect, does that mean I can't freely preach the gospel? Because what's the point of inviting everyone to Jesus if God's already, as it were, shut the door. Well, look at verse 28. To everyone, including those he's just been denouncing, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Did you hear that? Could there be a, a warmer, more gracious, more friendly, more gentle invitation? And there's no one that Jesus doesn't invite, is there? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. Are there men there from, and women there and boys and girls from Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum? Says Jesus, come to me. Are there worse sinners there than, than Tyre and Sidon? Are there greater sinners there than the folk of Sodom? Says Jesus, come to me. The invitation to come to Jesus for rest is made to everyone. And no one is excluded except those who exclude themselves. A friend of mine said, all who uh, labor and are heavy laden. Well, Jesus is speaking to those who are laboring under a sense of their sin and under a sense of guilt. And it's only to them, only those who feel their sin, does Jesus extend this right to come and find rest. Well, that's rubbish. It doesn't say that, does it? How can you narrow an invitation which is extended to all? How can you qualify Jesus' words when he simply says to everyone, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. The only qualification you need is that you're laboring, you're heavy laden. And what man, woman, boy or girl living in this cursed and broken world is not struggling, is not heavy laden. It's not saying only if you feel your sin, only if you feel your guilt can you come. It's just simply thrown out to all, laboring under the weight and burden and griefs and sorrows of a cursed world. If you feel the weight of that and it's crushing you, says Jesus, then come to me. In other words, it is the free, free, free offer of the gospel. No one is excluded. The invitation is to everyone and to all. And therefore, this doctrine of election, far from closing the door to the preaching of the gospel, it actually opens it wide. I go to everyone, and I invite everyone, 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 whoever they are, however I'm promising their situation, I invite them to Jesus Christ. Paul comes to Sin City, Corinth. He feels intimidated, as you and I would be. How can you preach the gospel to such a wicked and yet sophisticated and proud and hostile people. 
And this is what the Lord says to him. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many people in this city. Says the Lord to Paul, Corinth is filled with the elect. For I have many people in this city. They don't know they're elect. As you didn't know you were elect when you were called. But Corinth is filled with the elect. So Paul, don't be afraid. I'm with you. Preach the gospel. Stretch your arms as wide as you can. Invite all and everyone. And when the lost sheep hear the voice of the shepherd, they will come running. They will come home. When uh, Paul preaches at Antioch, we read this, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Paul, in Corinth, there are many who are appointed to eternal life. They're the chosen. When you preach the gospel, that's the means by which I bring them home. When they hear my voice, they will believe. And therefore, Christian friends, if you know your Bible history and if you know your church history, the doctrine of election has been the engine for preaching the gospel. It's been the engine for sending missionaries across the face of the earth. It's been the engine for preaching the word because however unpromising the situation, however hostile my audience, we never lose heart because God is at work. And through the preaching of Christ, through the invitation of all, he will bring his elect home. So Christian friend, look at the UK at the moment. And yes, be cut, be grieved, be pained, because folk don't repent, but don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. How can we lose heart? God is at work. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. If they don't believe, God is at work. If they do believe, God is at work. He hides, he reveals. So bow the knee and worship. And then get out there <laughs> and by lip and by life, Preach Jesus Christ. The only hope for a ruined humanity. Do you see what Jesus does? You are responsible for your sin. And God is sovereign. He's hidden it from you. He doesn't try to reconcile them. He bows a knee for so it seemed good in your sight. But then he throws open his arms and says to everyone, Come! The free offer of the gospel. And therefore, when I look at the UK, I have to say as Christian friends, there has never been a better time to preach Jesus Christ. And hear me right when I say this. We don't need revival. We need the gospel. We need gospel churches. We need Christians on fire for Jesus Christ. We need Christians who love the Lord hate their sin, love each other, love their neighbour, stretch out their hands and live for Jesus Christ. That's what we need. We don't sit in our seats waiting for something to happen. It might happen when I'm dead and gone. <laughs> I spent all my years waiting for something. Now is the time. This is the only time I can serve the Lord, only time I can live for the Lord, only time I can preach Jesus Christ. These neighbours will be gone soon, I'll be gone soon. Don't wait for a better time, a golden age, a special moment. It's now, it's here. This is the only time we've been given. There's never been a better time to preach Jesus Christ. God has put that responsibility on you in this generation. What we need is the gospel. We need gospel churches. So when I stroll up and down the streets around here, yes, it cuts, it grieves. And the wise and the prudent say, oh, that's very nice, but not for me, thank you very much. I, my eyes are open. I, don't, I won't fall for any of that. But we're not going to let that 
take the heart out of us. If God wants to blind eyes, we know He will open eyes. And we get out there and we live the gospel. We preach the gospel. We open our arms to all and we say, come to Jesus Christ. Yes? Yes? yes. yes. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, we need gospel churches. We need this church to be a gospel-loving, gospel-living, gospel-preaching church. Love Jesus Christ with all your heart. Love one another. Love one another. Don't pick and choose and sit on the fringe. Love one another. Love your neighbor. And love him enough to make yourself look a complete idiot by telling him the gospel. Be wise about it. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. All right. So number five. What if you're not a believer? This doctrine of election. What if, what if you don't believe this morning? Maybe you resent this teaching. You know, God seems sort of big, doesn't he, and invisible. And he seems angry. And God seems arbitrary. He just says, well, I'll have you, but I won't have you. He picks and chooses. There's a terrifying vision of God's wrath in Revelation 16. And as the final judgment falls, it's an avalanche of his wrath. And as that avalanche falls upon the lost, what do we read? And in some senses, I find this the most... Well, read it for yourself. We, it, it, we read they cursed God. What people really hate is not the doctrine of election. What people really hate is God being God. What people hate is God having control. God being in charge. Which is why even as the lost are punished, there's like a little piece inside them that refuses to yield. I will not be conquered by this God because I hate the fact that God is God and therefore even as he punishes me, I will curse him. I will not yield. I will not bow the knee. That's what people hate. They hate the fact that God is God. And we chafe at his sovereignty and we resent the fact that he's God. That God is free to do what he wants. But why are we reading this? Because what has this God freely done? When he exercised his choice, what did he choose to do? He stepped into our world, not to condemn, but to save. And if on this day he says to that crowd, he opens his arms wide and says, come to me, Another day will come when he will open his arms wide and they will be nailed to a cross. And that was his choice. It was his choice to die the punishing death. Sinners deserve to die. So that whoever believes in him, whoever you are, should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, I was in Sri Lanka, I've said this before. I said again, I saw two oxen pulling a big heavy cart. It was so heavy that one of them st almost stumbled. But because it was yoked to the other, it was a double yoke, it went over both their shoulders. Because they carried the load together, although it nearly stumbled, it didn't fall. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you see what Jesus is saying to you? He's saying, living in this world, we carry an impossible burden. It's too much for one. Which is why we go through life stumbling, falling, hurting, injuring ourselves. Jesus says our lives are in the grip of of, of powerful, destructive forces. 
my fears, my frustrations, my pains, my sicknesses, disappointments, sorrows, suffering, the pressure of having to prove myself, of having to succeed, the anxieties of fitting in and belonging, and always tracked by the shadow of death. And let's be honest, our hearts are often heavy, heavy, heavy. And we can count those moments which have been free and easy and happy, but they always pass. And even that sometimes brings a sadness. You can have the best day in your life, and as, the life, as that day comes to an end, you know, I'm not going to be able to revisit this day. This day will be gone forever. And we labor under that. And it crushes us. And yes, there are our sins and our guilt and all that unfinished business. And I know that I must go to death, a death for which I am not ready. And without Jesus, that is crushing. Stephen Fry said, I'm one of the privileged people who doesn't believe in life after death. Therefore, I can enjoy life to the full. But without Jesus, we can never enjoy life to the full. We labor. We're heavy laden. We're stumbling under the load. It's too much. And we long for rest. And Jesus this morning doesn't say to you, are you elect? He simply says, are you stumbling? Are you heavy laden? Is the load of living in this world crushing you? Maybe as a teenager, maybe as a dad, maybe as a wife, maybe as a single, maybe as someone who's most of their years are now behind them. And it's crushing you. He says, all you need to know, are you burdened way down? Well, he says, come to me. The only qualification you need, come to me. Come under my rule. Put your neck under my yoke. Don't be afraid. It's a yoke that's lined with love. Walk beside me. Let the load that will crush you, let me carry that on my shoulders. And in fact, let me lift from your shoulders that weight, that burden of your sin and of your guilt. And as you come to Jesus Christ, you won't find an angry, arbitrary God. You will find that the touching point is his gentleness. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we Faced with this teaching, Lord, we're out of our depth. Uh, we cannot climb, Lord. We cannot see. But we bow the knee. We thank you, our Lord Jesus Christ has given us a, a beautiful response to these very things. And we pray, Lord God, that you would bring our lives into line with him. And we thank you it's not fatalism. We thank you it's a loving trust an all-wise, loving Father, whose will is gracious. And Father, we pray this morning, Lord, if we do not know you, O oh Lord, speak to us, draw us to yourself, and may even this morning we find rest for our souls, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.